Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Kami Dogu Podcast. I am Christopher Belginovsky, and joining me as always is the man, the myth, the legend, Toasty. Toasty! Welcome back to another phenomenal episode today. Before we get going with the introduction of our guest, I just wanted to take the time to thank two particular people right now. The first of which is the legendary community member, living human Mortal Kombat encyclopedia. You all know who it is. The one and only Justin Tabmock 99. The reason I want to give a shout out particularly is due to the fact of what you said in Wichita, Justin. Um, we have an incredible guest today, and this may not be happening today if it wasn't for you, my very good friend. You vouched for me, you always have my back, and I'll never forget the kind words that you had given Ho Sung about my work at Dave & Buster's. <laughs> good times. Won't forget it. Last, but certainly not least, I want to give a shout out to the very person joined with me right now who happens to be stuck on a little island called Australia, Christopher <laughs> Veljanovsky. Brother, you gave me the opportunity to express myself and my undying passion for Mortal Kombat. I've known you since around 2006, working on Kamidogu. I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for you approaching me to start a unique Mortal Kombat project of some sort. We decided to start something of this caliber, a small little podcast, just to test the waters and see where it would go. Lo and behold, we have gotten some of the most extraordinary guests that I thought simply would never be possible. But you believed in me and my work, and at the end of the day, we are an inseparable team. I strongly believe, with all my being, that we have made the most premium product together, and I couldn't be more proud. We continue to work extremely well together, and I just want to thank you for not only being a good teammate, but most importantly, for being a brother. Somebody that I trust, and somebody that I can call family. Thank you so much, Chris. Love you, brother, and to be honest, there is no Coming Dogu podcast without you. I can't see oh. this project moving forward without you. If you bailed on me one day, that would be the <laughs> end of the podcast. So don't go anywhere, please. And I, I thank you as well, because you're the one who made this happen. This this was my my dream. And if you didn't say yes, it never would have happened. So thank you. Oh, man. Yeah. You know, it's it's been a blast. And like I said, some of the best moments of my life. So, um, you know, I don't plan on going anywhere. And yeah, again, we've made a great pro product here. And, you know, I'm in it until the very end. Um, we're going to stick together on this one, man. So, yeah, it's been great. Appreciate it. Now, Kamidogu. Fam, today is, it's still hard for me to fathom, but we have the exclusive pleasure of interviewing the very first Liu Kang in Mortal Kombat history, Ho Sung Pak. Very well recognized across the globe for his amazing ability in martial arts and stunt performance. A Wu Shu champion who was inducted into the Black Belt Hall of Fame in 1991. He has gone on to work with the likes of Jackie Chan and many other distinguished actors. Ho Sung has worked extremely hard on some of his passion projects, such as the Book of Swords and Fist of the Warrior. Please make sure to support him by checking these out. We're sure you'll have a good time. It wouldn't be much of an introduction if we didn't mention he is a freaking teenage mutant ninja turtle. Ho Sung had the opportunity to do stunt work for the Raphael character in both TMNT2, The Secret of the Ooze, alongside TMNT3. Of course, being the podcast we are, we'll be sure that a large portion of this podcast will revolve around everyone's favorite Shaolin warrior, the chosen one, Liu Kang. Some MK fans may not realize that he is also um, another character in the first Mortal Kombat game. Be sure to stick with us in this podcast to find out exactly who that is. Without further ado, let's now continue to today's interview. Okay, combatants, we are now joined by the remarkable Ho Sung Pak. I personally had the luxury of getting to know Ho Sung in Wichita. An absolute pleasure to have you here today, my friend. I know you're going out of your comfort zone to do this, and so for that, I wanted to say thank you a tremendous amount 
for choosing Kamidogu today. Well, it was great meeting you in Wichita, first off, uh, and happy to do this. Awesome. Fantastic. It sure was, man. It was a pleasure. So to kick things off today, um, you were born in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, what had piqued your interest in the world of martial arts? And perhaps could you fill us in on uh, your history of getting to know Daniel Pacina, along with many of uh, your other close friends who originally started Mortal Kombat? Sure. Um, so martial arts, is, it's an interesting thing. I actually wanted to be a baseball player when I was young. Really? So I played baseball since I was eight. From like sun up to sundown, you know, you're a kid, you go to the park with your friends and you just play literally all day. So that was my, um, my ambitions was to be a baseball player. And I, I was pretty good at it. And then um, my brother got into martial arts through a Bruce Lee movie. And I uh -huh. looked really cool. So I said to myself, I want to try that. So I tried it and I, I really fell in love with it. And I think it's the... Uh, intensity of the martial arts and it's something where you can take that from start to finish on your own like if you want to be great at it then you spend a lot of time on it if you don't want to be as good you just want to just be a practitioner then great you can do that in itself too but everyone has their own journey and everyone it I, I feel like it will help you in many different aspects martial arts wise um, and through discipline focus and I felt like in Every aspect of my life, it could help me. So I wanted to pursue it and keep pursuing it. Uh, and as I did it, um, you know, I was I got pretty good at it. Uh, yeah. But in general, I was inspired by my brother and Bruce Lee movies uh, when ah. I was younger. Yeah. So uh, you specialized, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Taekwondo. Uh, you later started practicing Lama Kung Fu uh, and some other ones, correct? Wow, you're pretty good at this. So, um, yes. So I started Taekwondo because my dad actually put me in Taekwondo. And the funny thing is, I felt like it helped me with my baseball, right? Because ah. it does help you focus. I feel like every athlete should take martial arts um, because it, help, it helps in many different ways. It helps your flexibility, your strength, your flexibility, your hand. -eye. It helps, you know, in, in so many different ways. So every athlete should take martial arts, whether it be Taekwondo, Kung Fu, Karate. I think it will help um, whatever athletic endeavors you want to pursue. Um, so yes, Taekwondo first, and then Lama Kung Fu second, and then Seven Star Praying Mantis third, and then Wushu fourth. And Wushu I learned from a few different people, uh, one of them being the coach of Jet Li, which is uh, Coach Wang Jinbo. Oh, wow. Um, and, and I went to China with Tony, actually Marquez, to, um, to learn that. Yeah. And in terms of, and also my brother, uh, Wushu, because he went to China to learn first and then came back uh, and taught, uh, taught us Wushu. Uh, Lama Kung Fu and Seven Star Praying Mantis. We all took Seven Star Praying Mantis. Me, my brother, uh, Tony Marquez, um, Daniel Piscina, uh, to a lesser extent, Rich Divizio and Carlos. Uh, but they did a little bit of it also, but to a lesser extent. But uh, all of us have a little bit of Seven Star Praying Mantis uh, background. So, yes. Uh, oh. And for me, I feel like being diverse in martial arts uh, is also really good, whether it be Taekwondo, Karate, um, Kung Fu, Wushu. They all have good things. Um, so I feel like if you take the best of each art, then you can you know, just better yourself in terms of the whole repertoire of martial arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't true. like it when people say, oh, this martial arts is better or that's better. It's really not. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all martial arts. And can we not all just get along? <laughs> hey, man. That's it. <laughs> um, you are, of course, the original Luke Kang, and you appeared in the first two games. Did you happen yes. to keep anything from those games, like any costume or I have like the that? shoes and the pants in the first game. Nice. Oh, because, because the first game, as you guys kind of know, uh, you know, there wasn't really a big budget for it. So they asked, hey, do you have black pants and some shoes you could bring in? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I used to work on these black pants, so I brought these black pants and these shoes. So th that's what I have left. Now, in the second game, John provided the wardrobe for the characters. So John might have the pants for the second game, uh, which I think is a pretty cool uh, pants. Um, but the shoes, the shoes are still mine in the second game. Um, okay. But the pants, John would know more about the pants, and John would know more about the bandana. Okay. That's, uh, okay. that's John. Uh, it is a known fact that everyone involved in the first Mortal Kombat game helped 
create some of the signature moves, had input for the fatalities, victory poses, etc. Was there anything while working on the first game you can confirm was heavily played out due to your influence? Uh, for instance, I'm pretty sure that you practically came up with Liu Kang's fireball pose off the fly? Yes, so fireball to me is like the signature of Liu Kang, right? Yeah. And so instead of giving just, I, I believe in most cases at this point, people just used some movement as like a projectile, right? Um, so I thought it's got to be something different, something more uh, elaborate than that. So I thought of the, you know, as the arm circles around and, um, and the fireball gets uh, thrown out, I thought of something uh, more interesting, something unique. Um, and to do the single leg, um, yeah. it's, uh, so correct. I, and I did think of that on the fly. Um, we were given a lot of latitude and lead way to do different types of movements. So, um, it was that in that, and then the, uh, the final, the, um, the finish him, the butterfly kick with the uppercut, right? Uh, yes. I just did the butterfly kick, but, uh, John added the uppercut, uh, to that. And we actually had a lot of other really cool things that were not able that was not able to make it into the game because, unfortunately, the game only had so many um, uh, so much memory. Right back then, this is back mm -hmm. in nineteen ninety. Yeah. Uh, so because of that, uh, uh, with only so much memory, we weren't able to um, put in all the things we wanted to put into it. Yeah, like. Uh a butterfly twist or something like that, right? Yeah, so we did a butterfly twist. So they have it there somewhere, um, butterfly yeah. twist. Uh, because I was hoping, like, in theory, the butterfly twist could have been used for the fin uh, final movement or, or the finishing movement. Or in part two, where they did the bicycle kick, it could have been the butterfly twist as it keeps twisting similar to that of the bicycle kick, right? Yeah. So they could have used that, but I, I think whether through the complexity or maybe John's a better person to ask, uh, they decided not to go with that and to go with something else, which is fine. Okay. But I think it would have been kind of cool to use a butterfly twist. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because sure. back then it wasn't a popular move. Now it's popular, but back then it was not right. Not that many people back then knew how to do a butterfly twist or even knew about it. Um, mm -hmm. now everyone knows it, but, um, so I feel like if they did use it back then, it would have been pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of Mortal Kombat's biggest draw cards um, was, of course, its crazy violence um, and use of gore and fatalities. Um, Liu Kang, however, being a monk, um, his fatality was quite toned down. Did, was there ever talk about that being made a little more violent by either yourself or the team? Um, you know, I don't think there was any types of type of violent, um, you know, considerations for Liu Kang. I, I feel like even the the dragon, you know, chopping down on it in part two. I feel like that's probably violent enough uh, for yeah. the Luke Kang character. Um, so I do feel like they stay true to the character. And I think John did a wonderful job in giving each and every character its life and its form and yeah. um, giving it, um, yeah, like you said, like the monk, you don't want it to be too violent. And like Kano, you could be super violent, right? And so with uh, Scorpion and Sub-Zero. So I feel like John did a great job in giving each character life. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what everyone may not know is that you also played the older Shang Tsung in the very yes. first Mortal Kombat game. Um, what are some highlights of this experience? I'm going to assume this was much shorter to film compared to Liu Kang's footage. Yes. So actually, you know, they weren't sure what they wanted, you know, which is understandable. So we had this little mask on and this um, uh, outfit. The outfit was pretty cool. So I think John w would still have that outfit. Um, and they were like, oh, let's try this. Let's try that. So that that was purely experimental. Right. It was just like, oh, let's see what happens here. Let's see what happens there. Um, so um, th that was just uh, probably not even half the time of the Liu Kang character. Because the Liu Kang character, like we tried a bunch of different things and then we had to come back and redo it, some of it. And then, um, you know, what I really liked about uh, doing the Liu Kang character and even Shang Tsung is I always felt like I could give them more and give them something better, right? And I believe if Ed ever decides to release some of the footage from behind the scene, you'll see that. Um, and it's strictly up to Ed if he wants to release it or not. But uh, And if he does, it would be really cool. And didn't he have mm. a sword or something at one point? Say that one more time. 
didn't Shang Tsung had a have a um a sword at some point? Yes, correct. I did a bunch of moves with the sword also. Um, so yes, I'm not sure what they were uh, considering with that, but uh, maybe it was supposed to be like the mighty sword that uh, could take down anything and everything. Uh, but yeah, and they have the footage. So if one day they, they decide they want to give that a shot, they certainly can. I'd love to see that. <laughs> yeah, yes. that would be, tell me about it. I would even like to see that, right? That would be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I am of the understanding that the first Mortal Kombat was originally slated to have much more characters, uh, but they had drastically shortened the roster uh, as it was overly ambitious and there were time constraints. Uh, was there ever talks within the first game for you to possibly play another character in the early stages, or was it always going to be strictly Liu Kang and Shang Tsung? I, you know, I think we had mentioned there were, oh, maybe we'll do this, we'll play that, but um, it was not a big consideration. I think um, the core that they wanted to get down, they got down. And any ancillary stuff, if it happened, great. If not, then no big deal. But I think the core was what they needed, and they got the core. Oh, that's, okay. That's, that's kind of what I remember, uh, because there were talks about it, but it was never, uh, it was never serious. It wasn't ever uh, like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this, and then we ended up not doing it. It was just talking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to clarify with our audiences, did you actually end up wearing the full suit that Liu Kang was originally intended to wear during his intro animation? Ed Boon would later wear this outfit instead, posing as a fallen victim of the pit. So the full outfit as in the the, the top, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. In fact, <laughs> you know, I, the thing about the top is I don't know if we use my top or John's top. John brought, I, I that I forget, but correct. So we did some stuff with the top, which is crazy, but I don't remember what we did with the top, but we did do some stuff with the top. So that is <laughs> correct. Um, my memory serves me not so well back uh, with the top um, because so much movement was done without the top, right? Um, but yeah, um, gosh, we did do some stuff with the top. I hope Ed has the footage and, and decides to show it one day. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... Way back when, um, yourself, Daniel, Catalan, and, and Philip were all involved in a, a royalty dispute with uh, developer uh, Midway Games following the release of Mortal Kombat 2. Uh, while yes. I'm sure it still remains a contentious issue for you all, um, would you be willing to share with your fans sort of how this whole um, thing happened? So it's not a contentious issue uh, in my, okay. from my perspective. Um, you know, it was unfortunate. I, I can't say too much about it, but what I will say is um, it, we were given one set of parameters and a different set of, of things happened. And that was the, um, uh, that was the, the dispute. And so it had nothing to do with John or Ed uh, because I forever uh, am grateful uh, for John and Ed for creating the game. And in terms of, it was just a con with a contract with Midway. And that was it. And unfortunately, Midway at this point, uh, they're no longer, right? Um, but it, it was just with them. And it was just um, a dispute in terms of for um, the gaming itself and what the contract had stated and what uh, happened to the game thereafter. Uh, probably is the most I could say right now. But I, I will say this uh, in the ancillary part of it. Um, so... In regards to John and Ed, uh, the creators of the game, uh, I am forever grateful. And in terms of, uh, like some people might think, oh yeah, um, that I may not have a good relationship with him, but I do. And I, I, with John, I think it's amazing that he created this game uh, yes. along with Ed. Uh, and Ed programming it and creating it with John. Um, and there's also some, I will say this, there's also, um, I guess people will take sides one way, or the, one way or the other. And this is probably where uh, Mortal Kombat, uh, unfortunately, is. this is the, the downside of Mortal Kombat. Um, some people will say that other people were creators and, and so on. Um, but let's look at just the film aspect of this uh, from a film uh, perspective uh, or entertainment perspective. Sure. So you have the producers. Um, or creators in this in this case, and that would be John and Ed, right? And then you would have 
um, like the choreographers. In this case, the choreographer would be Daniel, who did an amazing job mm -hmm. um, choreographing it along with John. Um, but I would say Daniel's probably, you know, the choreographer of uh, Mortal Kombat. And then you have all the actors in play, uh, myself, Rich, um, uh, Carlos, uh, Liz, Daniel, uh, for the first game. Uh, you have us as the actors um, uh, of the game. And so to me, um, that's kind of how it stands. Um, like the director, producer would be um, John Tobias, um, the programmer, producer, um, uh, creator uh, would be Ed. So they would be co. And then all of us played a role, an, an amazing role at that in, in a game that's still talked about, which is 30 years later, it's just literally amazing. Um, but, you know, to give full credit to Ed and John for creating such a wonderful game um, and for it to last 30 years. I mean, if you think about how many games last 30 years, um, yeah. it's not many. So <laughs> uh, I just want to give credit where credit's due and to give thanks to um, the people who did create the game, in this case, Ed and John, um, and Daniel for having me on board along with uh, John Tobias having me on board uh, and Ed, uh, and Daniel for doing all the choreography for it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know, the most important aspect of everything is really the fans and you guys. So I appreciate, number one, you guys interviewing me. And number two, all the people that still play the game, that still love it, that still talk about it. Um, we appreciate it very much. So thank you. Wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so let's dive a little more into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm aware you were involved in two and three uh, doing stunts for Raphael. Um, what are some intriguing stories you have during your time on set? Uh, yet again, uh, it's actually, this is actually a project where you worked with Daniel and Rich. Yes. So I got the role competing in martial arts tournaments and um, the uh, coordinators, the stunt coordinator, um, asked if I would be one of the characters. And I'm like, heck yeah. Um, and when I was competing, I was doing very well. I, that year, I was rated number one in martial arts uh, in North America. So nice. when he asked, I was like, sure, I'll be, I'd love to do it. So when I got there, they needed bad guys, which foot soldiers. So I was like, Daniel and Rich, they could do it. So I called them. I said, hey, do you guys want to come and be foot soldiers? And they're like, yeah. So they drove down the audition, then they got it. Uh, obviously, they're very talented. Um, and in terms of, so that was my first foray into the entertainment industry. Uh, Mortal Kombat was second af uh, after the Turtles. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm grateful for being a part of that. You know, again, another thing that survived 30 plus years, 40 years, uh, whatever it happens to be uh, for Turtles, however long it has survived, which is amazing again, right? How many cartoons yeah. and how many uh, IP survived that long? Um, so, Again, for Turtle fans, I appreciate it. Um, and in terms of the filming, what was hard was, if you asked me to do it now, I couldn't do it because it was hard. You were filming 12 hours a day in the suit, which weighed about 40 pounds altogether. And to be able to do all the moves, uh, and to, for example, I did a back handspring uh, in this one scene. And we had, I think we did like 12 takes and I had to do two back handsprings each time, so 24. And every back handspring felt like it, 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 it basically killed me. Um, yeah. <laughs> because you're going 40 pounds. And the problem is it's the shell. And the shell doesn't let you bend so much, right? Because it's really hard uh, and it's heavy. Uh, so everyone that you do, and you can't see, right? Basically, you're doing blind. And it's not like I'm a gym uh, gymnastics expert. I, I'm pretty good at it, but I wasn't an expert by any means. Uh, so it, it was really difficult. Um, and then there's a scene where Raphael gets captured. Uh, and we filmed that all morning and we did so many takes. I think I had to go to the hospital and just get some uh, IV after that because it was it was completely draining. I think that morning I drank six, uh, six cans of Mountain Dew, two, <laughs> two liters of Coke, um, and some and water, a bunch of uh, water. Wow. And I, I, I think after drinking all that, that whole morning, I don't think I, I went to the restroom because, well, first of all, I couldn't because I was filming all morning for that sh uh, scene. Oh. And uh, I think it was, so we start, must have started like 7 a.m. and then ended at like 12 or 1, uh, that scene. And 
after that scene, I was like, literally, I, I felt like I could just rest for sleep for like a week straight. Um, and so after that scene, um, they let me rest at the hospital for a little bit. And then I came back and we finished up the day. But to, to start filming at six in the morning or 630 and then finish at six every single day being in the uh, outfit, uh, six days a week was really hard. And I don't oh. know if people appreciate the the what it took to do that um it, to just wear the costume itself think of it as it, it probably goes to about 100 120 degrees in that between there so when you do all the movements it gets even hotter uh, mm. i remember it wasn't that uh cold outside but i remember steam just coming out of my body because of all the heat that you have oh. um, and it wasn't that cold this is north carolina um so just you know that in itself was hard and there were days where you know friends would want to hang out till two o'clock in the morning and so i would and then we would have to work at 6 a.m and you're pretty tired so Ugh. what i learned to do was i learned and it, it was tiring so i learned to like close my eyes and probably take a power nap like a two minute power nap standing up with my full costume on <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> that, that was that was uh, yeah that was kind of incredible looking back and i'm like wow i did that um, but you're so tired that you would have to do that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's dedication. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if, if they asked if I would do it, if I could do it again, like if probably one or two days in the suit, I'd be like, guys, I'm done. It, looking back, I don't even know how we did. I think we did like 10 weeks, six days a week, um, uh, every single day. Looking back, I'm not even sure how I was able to do it. Mm. Yeah. That's intense, man. Yeah. Um, so, so you yeah, also those are the scenes and that's uh, that's the turtles and I appreciate you guys um, you guys watching it and uh, enjoying it. We appreciate Absolutely. you. <laughs> yeah. um, you also start in a film with uh, Jackie Chan, uh, the Legend of Drunken Master, in which you shared a pretty intense um, fight with. Uh, what was it like working with him on that project? And do you have any um, memories around that time as well? Yes. So. Um, uh, Sifu La, who, who I called um, the director, was his name is Sifu La, or I, uh, I called him Sifu La. So he picked me when I was in Turtles 3. He came to Turtles 3 and then he uh, asked if I would be in a movie with him. I said, sure. I did not realize it would be Drunken Master with Jackie Chan. Uh, and I was a big fan of Jackie's. Uh, working with them was great. The only downside, working with both of them was great. The only downside was Jackie and Sifu La, for whatever reason, they had disagreements or they had uh, something where it wasn't uh, it wasn't in the best situation, and I was unfortunately caught in the middle uh, because uh -huh. I was I was recruited by Sifu La, uh, and it was Jackie's film. Uh, so being kind of stuck in the middle was was the hard part. But working for both Sifu La and Jackie, uh, tremendous. And I learned a lot from Jackie and how he choreographed fight scenes. Um, uh, you know, and every uh, every shot was very intense. There was one, there was one scene that we did twenty seven takes of, and <laughs> I just remember my body just feeling the next day, just like <laughs> it was about to die. And when I say that it was twenty seven, it was hard. It was like a bunch of kicks, a bunch of punches, and uh, things like that. It, it was like a, a long take, um, and I just remember my body just felt like it, it was like about to collapse. Um, so. Yeah, working with both of them, great. Unfortunate, the, the, the dispute that they had um, or disagreement that they had uh, was the only unfortunate part. Yeah. Um, jumping back to Mortal Kombat, when we were in Wichita, we had a very interesting conversation regarding the newest Mortal Kombat movie. Now, obviously, we don't have to speak uh, of all the deep specifics, but I know that you were a little indifferent uh, about the 2021 film. As a person heavily oriented in the film industry yourself, what do you think the next MK movie needs to improve upon in order to be seen on an even higher note with fans? So, yeah, the, the thing about Mortal Kombat is I want it to do well, right? Because that's how the legacy lives on. Like, I want the movie to be great. Um, so some people might think, oh, he's just saying that because he's not in the film or this or that. And that has nothing, like, I don't care. I would love the legacy to live on for myself, for Daniel, for John, for Ed, and for the Mortal Kombat fans. Of course. So you yeah. want the movie to be great. I think a couple things need to happen. I think they need to ask John and Ed 
about the direction it should go. Number one, right? 100%. Because they're the ones that created it. They know the energy behind it and what it should, uh, what it, what should happen, what it takes, and so on. Yeah. So they should ask Ed and John. Um, and um, I feel like they should stay a little bit more true to the theme of Mortal Kombat. And I felt like they got away from it, unfortunately, right? That's um, granted. And, yes. Yeah. And I feel like we all love fight scenes. We all want to see cool fight scenes. But it shouldn't be so long to the point where you get desensitized by it. right? And no you know, quick cuts. Fight. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. I, or if you do, just have some of it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, some. So, I, I, yeah, I feel like they could have done a much better job had they uh, talked to Ed and John um, if they'd stayed a little bit more true to the theme of Mortal Kombat. Um, like the very first Mortal Kombat that came out, what was great about also the first one was the music was awesome, right? Yeah. Yes. If you think about the, the, this last one, there's no really, um, there's no, mu there's none of the songs ever what stays with you. Right? Not At least too many. Opinion, right? No, yeah. not too many. Um, in the last one. So like the first one, you know, that some of it's we still recognize so i feel like with a really good soundtrack and um you know stay within the theme of mortal Kombat, uh and i feel like maybe just the fight scenes um could be i, I don't know if i want to use the word better but let me use the word different the fight scenes were uh, slightly different maybe yeah. it would give it um a little bit more energy to the characters uh is maybe the best way i could put it so I think if they could take care of that stuff, it would be fine. But the first and foremost thing would be talk to Ed and John, right? They, they will give uh, Mortal Kombat proper direction where the fans would love it. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you've made it public before, but are you, is it true that you're actually friends with Robin Chu? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, we, so Robin and I, we worked out when I was young, when I was like... Uh, Gosh, I must have been 16, 17, 18. I think huh? 16, right around that age. I I'm trying to think of the exact age. So my brother was friends with Robin. So we okay. went to California, my brother and I, and we worked out uh, with Robin and some of uh, his friends. Um, and then when I got to Hong Kong for Drunken Master, I ran into Robin by sheer accident. <laughs> and it was just like, oh my God. Uh, so we, we chatted for a little bit. Uh, and I think I was telling him about the video game uh, world, and he didn't really understand at that time the video game world, which was kind of funny because he ended up playing Liu Kang. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and he, so he's a great guy, uh, and for him to play Liu Kang, I think that was awesome. Um, and before we move on to this final segment, uh, I noticed something very interesting. You played a vampire guard in the film Blood Rain. The main actress attached to that project was Kristana Loken uh, in the Mortal Kombat television series Conquest. She played the leading female character named Tasha. Were you aware of this at the time of filming? And did you two ever speak of your experiences in Mortal Kombat together? You know what's funny? Uh, I, so I never watched the Mortal Kombat TV show, which I probably should have, but I just never got around to watching it. It's not no? because I uh, purposely just didn't watch it. I just didn't get around to it. Um, <laughs> but so we actually never spoke of it, which... Now that you mention it, you're right. She did play that. And I should have probably asked her how it was. Um, but the strange thing is we actually never talked about it. And she's such a sweet girl. Um, real nice. Uh, very cordial. Um, so one day I hope you get a chance to ask her how it was like to play the character in the TV show. She's that really nice. So, yeah. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to jump to the final round. So what we're going to do in this final round is ask you some quick questions, Ho Song. So are you ready? Let's do it. What was your very first job before the film industry? That's interesting you asked me that. So I was, I didn't really have a job job, but in college, I did some computer networking where I soldered some network. This is before the wireless stuff all came around where things were wired. So I had to solder uh, some of the computer networking um, to connect all the computers together. That was really my only, and that was like a wow. part-time job. My really, my o that was my only job besides the entertainment industry. Intriguing. Wow. Yeah, so I don't have like some crazy story of <laughs> oh I did this or I did that. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Yeah. What is your biggest phobia or fear? 
Interesting. You know, it, when I was younger, it used to be like just in, not so much um, phobia or fear, but like insects just did not like them, like spiders <laughs> and all these things. You know, like I think I had a dream when I was a kid where these huge spiders would you know, like, you know, come and attack me. So I'd have to like run away. And, you know, in those dreams where you try to run away, you can't run away. Like you're stuck, right? Oh, you're yeah. running <laughs> uh, uh, in quicksand. So uh, I just didn't like uh, uh, insects or spiders in this case. Uh, but you know, in terms of fear or phobias, kind of over that. But when I was younger, that's what it was. Oh, so, ugh, spiders do freak me out. I don't know. There's something about mm -hmm. all the different legs, man. <laughs> ah, that's right. Don't like it. That's right. Do you have any secret talents? Secret talents, you know, yeah, I wish I could tell you guys like something really cool, but I do not. Uh, but in terms of what like people would not know about me is like I, I went to and got my engineering degree and I got my master's in business. So I'm really good with numbers, right? Like people would think, oh, he's just an actor or just a stunt guy. Uh, but numbers wise, uh, pretty damn good with numbers. But yeah, that would be it. Brilliant. Are you all, are you, if, I, in fourth grade, I used to, yeah. So I, I was good at chess. I'm no longer good at chess. But in fourth grade, <laughs> I was a chess champion, which makes sense in terms of numbers, right? Like numbers and chess kind of come together. Yeah, absolutely. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is your guilty pleasure? Gosh, I'm going to have to say chocolate, ice cream, oh. uh, yogurt. Uh, when I say yogurt, <sighs> like um, like the Korean yogurt, which is like the pink berry type of stuff mm -hmm. um, when you go to Korea. Um, and you know that and then like all you can eat korean barbecue where oh. you go and make your food in front of you right damn straight Unfortunately, i like those things and see that is why i have to work out every day so i work out like <laughs> an hour to two hours every day uh because i like those things um and you know like people are like oh are you on a special diet i normally eat a little bit of anything that i want uh except when i go to korean barbecue i eat a lot but I do drink, like, for example, I do drink Coke. Uh, people say, oh, you shouldn't drink Coke because it's going to kill you. Uh, chances are, I think we'll all die before it kills us, right? <laughs> um, I think to have a Coke once in a while is totally okay. And it's sure. pretty darn good. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is the most daring thing you've ever done? The most daring thing? Yeah. Is that what you asked? Um, you know, I don't know if this was on purpose or accident, but I'll tell a story about Transformers 4. Ah. So in Transformers 4, Michael Bay being the director, um, there was this, all this water, a huge, like, it's like tidal wave that was created. And Michael Bay came to me and I was the last person on this, uh, like, chain, right? And I'm on a, this old bicycle that doesn't even really pedal. He asked if I could move back a little bit. So I was like, sure. So I moved back a little bit, which means I'm in the way of the wave. So the wave is out of the scene as the wave comes he asked me to move back and then for some reason i got the countdown too late so here's this huge wave of water coming as action is happening and i'm on this bike and it hits me like a baseball bat or Ooh. a bunch of different baseball bats i get knocked down from this bicycle hit my head on the ground Oof. and concussed and this water that is supposed to be uh, like a tidal wave, basically you're under this water. And I remember water. So I'm hit by this water on the ground, laid back. That hurt, but that wasn't the thing that was the, the thing that I think uh, got me. The thing that got me was I was pinned under a, imagine a huge truck, like in those trans, there's those huge trucks, right? I was pinned underneath the wheel of the truck. And I thought to myself, the truck was supposed to go on action. So I thought the truck was going to now move. And I'm pinned under and I'm trying to get out. I, uh, uh, I Literally, I'm trying to get out of being wheel. I can't because the water is so hot and it's rushing. And I'm stuck here thinking, I'm going to die. This oh, is yeah. it. So for, I, I don't... It felt like two minutes, but it was probably only like 30 seconds, right? It, maybe not even, but it felt like a couple minutes that I was going to die. And I was actually kind of surprised that I actually was aware enough be, being concussed by hitting 
having hit my head on the ground to trying to get out of this scene or situation. And I didn't know which way was up at that point because, you know, you're underwater. Yeah. So that was probably the scariest. All right. And final question. What piece of advice would you give to your younger self? Oh, wow. You know, there's so much. I'm not sure where I, the one would start. But what I would say for my situation, and, you know, people I think have different perspectives on this. Um, you know, let's just say you, that you have a thousand decisions and you probably make 500 wrong decisions in life. Uh, 500, right? 500 wrong, let's just say. So I would love to take all of it back. Um, the, the, I would say the main, one main thing you would tell your younger self is um, to be a better person, right? Like we could all, you could try harder, sure. Uh, you could be better at this. You could be better at that. Um, but the one main thing for everyone that we could all strive for, and that's all attainable, is to be a better person. Mm, yeah. Um, so to be kind to others, to um, to empathize with others. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're on this earth for not that long of a time. For some, it's much less than others. But uh, let's just say you get 100 years. Yeah. Uh, and in 100 years, try to make an impact in life where... Um, you you have a positive impact on other people, um, right? Don't be that person that has a negative impact on other people. That's right? right. That is that's probably the one main thing I would tell my younger self. And if I had to tell uh, talk to other people, is that um, uh, be kind to others and be a positive influence uh, on both yourself and other people. Um, I would say is the main thing. Amen. Well said. Beautifully stated. Well, Hosung, uh, I, I appreciate you being here so much. Uh, it's meant so much to me and Christopher. Uh, before we go today, is there any current or upcoming projects that you'd like to promote at this time? And uh, yeah, uh, let us know. Oh, so I've, I've been working on a project with uh, my business partner on a small, low-budget, independent sci-fi film. And when we're ready to announce it, I'll come back to your channel and talk about it. Um, but we're in post-production right now, which will take a while. Uh, but I will say one thing before we go is uh, I really enjoyed meeting you at Wichita. And for a oh, anyone that was oh, there, son. I think that they had a wonderful time. And for the people that missed it, hopefully I'll get a chance to meet some of you guys another time. Uh, because it, I don't do too many of these events. Yeah. But the fact that uh, I got a chance to meet you and some of the other people really made the event wonderful. And um, it it goes to show that you know people who really have very opposite things in life come together uh, from Mortal Kombat. Look at that. And, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. We, we get a chance to get together and have a commonality with Mortal Kombat. Um, and you're, first of all, you're a great singer. So I learned that. <laughs> about you. Um, and, uh, and you have great attitude and a great personality. So really appreciate appreciated it. meeting you. Yes, um, you know, you and everybody else at the convention, um, you know, quite frankly, you guys are heroes to me. My entire life since the age of four years old, Hosung, you know, I grew up on the Super Nintendo playing Mortal Kombat. I seen you guys every day for I don't know how many years. So to meet you was so surreal and uh, one of the highlights of my life. I cannot thank you enough. Oh, that's awesome. It's great to hear. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today means a lot. Me and Christopher have become quite busy as of late. We have lots around the corner, and we appreciate you all very much. We look forward to conversing with you. Let us know in the comments how much Liu Kang means to you. Until next time, have fun, stay safe, and stay flawless. <laughs>